I can remember when Molly and Christopher were first talking about starting this institute. It was 1995, Mancus, Colorado, and we were all there because of Deer Hill Expeditions. Molly and Christopher were engaged and had this vision of starting this school. They wanted to do what you have today. They were able to say, we want to do a program in the mountains, in the wilderness, that has an academic rigor to it for young people of a certain age and plays off the lessons of nature. It was fully formed as an idea. That's why it was so persuasive. When I talked to Molly early, I never tried to dissuade her, but when I talked to her in those early days, it was a done deal. No buildings, no kids, no driveway, but, but a done deal. Some of that's the energy of youth and some of it's the special, special quality of Molly and Christopher. They are truly amazing. You know, nobody was doing this at the time, or very few people. Uh, a semester program, a high school semester program, where people take a semester off from high school, come for this experience at this place they're gonna create, which is the High Mountain Institute in Leadville, and that be a formative part of their education. So yeah, it was really, really unusual and, and courageous, I think. We met in 1992 while working for Deer Hill Summer Expeditions down near Durango, Colorado. And that very first summer, I realized I had a big crush on Christopher. So, <laughs> so before we really started dating, I invited myself on a backpacking trip in the canyons with Doug Capelin and Christopher, and another friend of Doug's. And I was sort of asking Christopher, what's his life vision? And one of the things he talked about was potentially starting an outdoor school. It wasn't exactly the vision of the semester or what HMI became, but that was the very first conversation. And then the winter of 1993-94 is when Christopher put together the proposal for a semester school at the Orm School where he was teaching. And that's when we really started talking about it. Both Molly and I were um, working in schools and teaching outdoor education in the summers, working for Knowles and Deer Hill Expeditions. And you know, during the summers, there was not quite enough intellectual rigor. Uh, and during the school year, it was really wanting for this sort of intentional community that you get um, in wilderness settings. So it was born from those sort of dual frustrations that we came together with this idea of creating a semester school that merged together academics and wilderness. Um, and the obvious counterparty to that was small intentional community. The initial goal was to help students develop their own connections to the natural world and to do it in a way that wasn't just about fun, but had maybe an intellectual element, a physical element, a spiritual element potentially, just different ways of connecting to the outdoors. So it was really about combining our passions. What did we like? What kind of jobs did we want to have in our future? And how did we get there? We were just having these dreams of things that would be fun to do in our lives. And I really think when we were having those initial conversations, we were imagining, we're gonna do this in 10 years, what do we do between now and then to get ready for that? And it was Peter Neal that said, no, 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 go for it now. We met, uh, sort of officially in the context of High Mountain Institute in Aspen, Colorado. And Molly and Christopher came up and we met in a basement breakfast dive. And they had, a, for your young people, they had a very mature person's idea. And it seemed to us immediately that this was worth their effort. This was worth a try. And we said so. I was 25 when we started talking about HMI. And actually, I thought we should go back to graduate school and get some more experience doing different things. But Peter Neal um, convinced us not to do that. He said, don't be so silly. Start HMI while you're young, while you have energy. So there's a, there's a real opportunity here, and it will just it's worth a try to see if you can test the market. And by the way, why don't you get married at the same time? It'll make things simpler. Um, I remember getting an invitation to Molly and Christopher's wedding that said, in lieu of wedding gifts, please consider making a donation to HMI, which was this um, new startup. And I can still picture, actually, that wedding invitation. Their whole wedding was wrapped around the creation of the High Mountain Institute. Can you imagine, is there 
deciding to get married. They're also deciding to create this life together, deciding to create this institute together. We were lucky in that we got enamored with and fell in love with a dream, you know, something that we wanted to do that made sense to us. And so it was obvious to us that we should sort of slide all of this together. We kind of went all in, in terms of getting married, incorporating a nonprofit, starting a school. We just assumed that it could be done. Um, and I think that was actually an important piece of the puzzle was that assumption that it was worthy um, and that we ought to try. But it really came from a place of how do I think I can make a difference in the world? And where do my passions take me? And there's nobody else for whom I can go work and do these two things, so why not create it myself? Stepping out, more like stepping off a cliff? Yeah, stepping into the great unknown, you bet. We had to have rules about that, actually. Pretty early on, we figured out that we had to have an agreement, which was that only one of us was allowed to panic at a time. Uh, meaning that, you know, if I was freaking out about something in the process of like, oh goodness, are we gonna find the land to build the school on? Or if Molly was nervous about, oh, are any schools gonna even let us come and present and promote the program that doesn't exist yet? Um, that only one of us was allowed to have that sort of anxiety moment at a time. The other one just had to stand there and say, no, no, it'll all be fine. It'll just be fine. We'll figure it out. It's kind of a funny thing. Yes, I was nervous. Yes, we were both worried at different times, but I don't know, there's a, there is great comfort that we took in each other and in Peter's support and things just kind of fell into place with, I mean, not easily. It was a lot of hard work, but everything that needed to happen did. If you go and you look at a school now, and you took, took, or just go and look at High Mountain Institute, and you take it apart, and you walk it back, you have to understand how complicated it is. We had to decide where. We had to decide how. Uh, we decided, had to decide when there were a million variables that suddenly were there in front of us. In the very early days, we'd hoped to open in 1997. We pretty quickly figured out that we needed one more year, so we opened in the fall of 1998. Some of the really intense times were about a year or so before we opened our doors, 1997, as there's just a lot going on. Uh, Molly went off and visited about 100 independent schools and essentially asked, hey, can I come back next year and promote this program? Um, and she was very heavily involved with developing the relationships with the outside world to attract our first cohort of students. Um, I was completely tied up with find the land, raise the money, build the campus. So we divided our tasks pretty early on, um, and both of those at times were pretty daunting. When the very first student arrived, Leah Chubb Silverman from Miss Porter School, the kitchen wasn't even fully set up. She helped us scrub out the first refrigerator that we had purchased. The front door of the main building famously was a you know, swinging piece of plywood for the first couple of weeks before we finally got the nice door installed. So there were all kinds of things that just weren't done yet. But RMS1, they were pioneers. They were ready to help us create the semester in lots of ways. They were an extraordinary group, different from any other group, I think, for that reason. You have to ask yourself, who sends their kid to a program that doesn't exist? Right? They are pioneers. They always will be. They will always be particularly memorable, those first two semesters of students. We really were creating everything as we went. There were no systems. There were a few things that we could anticipate, but for the most part, we were reacting as we went, and the students were reacting with us. And so it was very collaborative in a way that no other semester has been. Uh, and that way, it was pretty fun. And when the students left, and they were all checked through security on their planes home in December that year. There was this palpable sigh of relief from all of us that worked here. And then, you know, a huge set of high fives and hugs and we did it and congratulations. And, you know, we, we popped a bottle of champagne right in Who's Hall. We were just ecstatic that we had gotten through that first semester so successfully. The system hasn't changed in years at this point, but each student group is really different and responds to it in a different way. And so it's always exciting around here. It's always fun to see how the students are gonna take on a different particular element of the semester, what the student reps are gonna do, who the SELs are going to be, what the class shakedown is gonna be like. And it's really interesting. Every single semester is different, even though the system and the pattern and what we as faculty and staff do doesn't change that much. Um, I'm very proud of the High Mountain Institute. I'm even more proud of what all of our faculty and employees and staff and apprentices have done over the years to build this institution. I think that the story of HMI is the story of many people 
engaged in a common mission, a common vision. And the folks who built this place, the folks who worked day in, day out with students, teaching them in the classroom, cooking meals with them in the kitchen, teaching them how to read the map in the backcountry, treating their blisters. Folks who really did that were the faculty and staff. And they really are the true co-creators of an institution. I think it does go back to Molly and Christopher. Whatever you want to call it, openness, transparency, feedback, it, it definitely starts with them and they role modeled that. It was never just something to do or a way to make a living or we could become known in the field or we could get a better job somewhere else or this will be a stepping stone. This was a very singular passion that came from who they are as people, who they are as a family. And that's what drives the, the energy, the humor, the courage, uh, the enthusiasm that makes something so authentic. They are real educators. They really are. Um, they're the genuine kind of educator. They want to educate the whole child. Um, so algebra is great and, and history is great and they do very well at the academics, but it's the whole package that matters. They're truly unique in the, in the outdoor and education arena in terms of their drive, how proactive they are, the vision, the enthusiasm, and the passion that they've executed their vision. To me, the biggest and maybe the most impressive thing that's out there is the idea is that you can turn a good idea into reality. You know, and that we have an example of something that was really audacious and really hard to do, and then they turned it into a debt-free school in 15 years with a growing endowment uh, waiting lists and uh, students and faculty that are dying to work there. Christopher and Molly really as, as gifted and connected and educated and intelligent as they are really could have gone down so many different paths and, and they knew that. They, they wanted to go down a path that would be meaningful for other people, that would be meaningful in a community and for them that was education for adolescents. What they are leaving behind is a, a very powerful institution that will make a difference for a lot of young people for many, many years. Having spent now the last couple of years in a more traditional educational setting and like reading about 21st century education, like going to conferences where 21st century education is the buzzword, like it didn't take me very long to realize that everything that people are talking about uh, in what education could and should be these days is what's happening at HMI. That's what they've given to the, to the world, really. It's a neat, neat program that lots of kids are going to get to go to. And hundreds have already gone. And every one of them will say this was life transforming. I'm a different person when I came home than when I left. And what else can you do for kids? You know, nothing. There's nothing more fun than that. <laughs> Excuse the emotion. But I've um, always set the bar higher for them. Put it up a notch. Put it up another six inches, another eight inches, another, um, and over they go. I could never say that anything but exceed my expectations. Oh God, it's unbelievable, unbelievable what they've done, and it's 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 done for life now. I know we are saying goodbye to them pretty soon, but HMI is going to go forever. It is fine, um, and they did that. What they, what they set out to do has been accomplished. And that's, you can't, you know, you can't ask for more than that. They have done what they dreamed and given it to, to us and to the world. <laughs>